here. It's good to be here. Well, good evening. Good evening. It is good. Wow, you know what? Um, there's more people here tonight than Pastor said. So I'm a little bit more nervous than I would normally be. Um, but it is good to be here. Excuse me, one uh, second. Sir? I left my glasses. Nope, they're right there. Sorry about that. I okay. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, if I took my glasses off, I wouldn't be able to see my Bible either. And uh, as I've gotten older, I've had to get bigger printed Bibles because I'm getting older and I can't see. But uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to preach, Pastor. I appreciate it. And uh, so we just got back from Alaska uh, a little over a week ago. We had five weeks up there and went to nine, uh, had nine meetings up there and had a good time. Got to see a lot of things, some moosin. And uh, didn't see any bear, but uh, we were disappointed in that. But I, I want to do something tonight that I've, that I've never done before. Um, and several months ago, our pastor preached a message uh, the, and he used a hymn, one of our good old-fashioned hymns, uh, for the outline. And it was really an interesting uh, study that he did. So I'd like to do something like that for you tonight. We are going to look into God's Word and see how it matches up. But I'd like to read to you a couple of stories behind two of the hymns. Uh, but first I want to pray and just ask the Lord to uh, guide tonight. So if you would, just bow with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I need you tonight. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would look on my heart, and I pray that if there's anything there that's standing between you and me tonight, uh, would you please forgive me of any sin that might be in my heart or in my life tonight. And I pray that you would empty me of myself and that you would fill me with your spirit. Help me to say tonight the things that you'd have me to say, nothing more, nothing less, and I'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. So the two songs that, that uh, I want to tell you about tonight, one is throw out the lifeline, and the other is let the lower lights be burning. Uh, and so the story behind let the lower lights, and I love that song. Uh, it has a lot of meaning. And uh, at one of D.L. Moody's meetings uh, in America, uh, he related the story of a shipwreck uh, on what they quoted as a dark and tempestuous night. So it was a stormy, it was a dark and stormy night, and the ship is trying to make it to the harbor of Cleveland, and, and the captain had a pilot on board that night, and and the, as they drew near, they could only see one light from the lighthouse there at the Cleveland Harbor. And all the other lights should have been burning along the shore, but they weren't. And the captain said, he asked the pilot, uh, he said, are you sure that this is Cleveland Harbor? And the pilot said, I am sure. And the captain said, well, where are the lower lights? And uh, the pilot said, they're gone out, sir. He says, can you make the harbor then? The pilot said, we must, sir or perish. And bravely, that pilot steered that boat toward the harbor, got her course toward safety, but in the darkness of that harbor, he missed the channel and the ship hit the rocks, and many lives were lost in that storm that night. Then Moody made his appeal to his audience. He said, brothers, the master will take care of the great lighthouse, but let us keep the lower lights burning. And among Moody's hearers that evening was Mr. Philip P. Bliss, a very popular songwriter, a well-known hymn writer, and, and he wrote that song. And the striking story suggested to him that song. And it, the first verse goes like this, Brightly beams our Father's mercy from his lighthouse evermore. But to us he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman you may rescue, you may save. The lower lights refer to the lights that are away from the lighthouse that illuminate the shore. And without those lights, those ships would surely be dashed upon the rocks and lives would be destroyed along with those ships. And without those lower lights, the seamen will never make it to the harbor. Without those lower lights, many lives would be lost. You and I, my friends, are the lights along the shore of this world. Two quick points I want to make before I get into the next one, and that is this. The hymns that we sing in church that we've been singing for, I don't know how many years. I know of 48 for myself and some of you for even much longer than that. These good old-fashioned hymns were written, and they have such a, a rich history. And if you have an opportunity to go back and look at the story behind some of these hymns, I would encourage you to do that. Secondly, for the sake of the story I want to share I want to tell you what a Lyle gun is, L-Y-L-E. A Lyle gun, if you don't know, is the line-throwing gun. It's a short-barreled cannon, and it is used or designed to fire a projectile attached to a rope that can, uh, that can be shot out to a boat or to a struggling 
uh, person victim in distress. And experiments in shooting tethered projectiles date back to around 1800. Uh, a mortar device called the Manby, M-A-N-B-Y mortar, was credited with saving lives as early as 1808. So this projectile gun was designed to throw out a lifeline to a ship or to somebody who was in distress out in the water to help pull them in and save their life. And that is the title of the other song, is Throw Out the Lifeline, and that is the title of the message tonight. Edwin Smith Euford often visited Nantucket Beach, a particularly dangerous coastal area. The local life-saving station at Point Allerton had a Lyle gun to shoot a lifeline to ships in need. In 1886, while they were watching a life-saving drill, they could see some of the previous shipwrecks out there. And a friend of his recounted the scene, which was reported in the Boston Globe. There was a schooner. It was being tossed in a storm, which threatened to smash it. And the lifeline was shot out several times, and it fell short. But then finally it reached the vessel, and it enabled the men to haul the ship in. And Smith went home that night. Euford, Edwin Smith Euford went home that night, and he wrote the song. Stanza number one focuses on the lost person. If you would turn with me to Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. But stanza number one in this song focuses on the lost person. We should be focused on seeking the lost. We should be focused on seeking those and showing them the way of salvation. And Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way of salvation. And Luke chapter 19, I guess I need to turn there also. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 says this, for, as the, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The words of the song say, throw out the lifeline across the dark wave. There's a brother whom someone should save. Someone's brother, oh, who will then dare to throw out the lifeline, his peril to share? That dark wave represents the tempest in someone's life caused by sin. In Romans 3.23, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a single person in this room who hasn't sinned. Believe it or not, your pastor has sinned. Believe it or not, my parents have sinned. My perfect wife has sinned. I have sinned. There are children who sin. And if you don't believe that babies are sinful, remember back to that time at 3 o'clock in the morning when that baby was screaming bloody murder and you walked in the room and they're just fine? They just wanted you to come in there with them. There's not a single person on this earth that hasn't sinned. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, by as, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for what? All have sinned. According to this passage, we've all sinned. There's no one exempt from it, and there's no room for argument when it comes to what God's Word says. Stanza number two of this song focuses on the person's need for help. Focus, the first one focuses on the lost person. In the second verse, on their need. It says, throw out the lifeline with a hand quick and strong. Why do you tarry? Why linger so long? See, he is sinking, O oh, hasten today, and out with the lifeboat, and away, then away. We need a hand quick and strong to go everywhere preaching God's word. Acts 8, 4, in the midst of, uh, right after Stephen was stoned, and he was he was martyred for his faith. He was killed for his faith. He was murdered. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. That passage again was written after the death of Stephen. It caused a great stir so that the Christians were scattered abroad, and they went and they preached the gospel everywhere, and they also preached with boldness. Acts chapter 4 and 29, the prayer was, it says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. We need to pray that prayer that God would give us, especially in today's day, especially in the times that we're living in right now. We need to ask the Lord to give us boldness. It's very easy to stand in front of a bunch of believers and proclaim God's word. But it's difficult when we get out into the world and we see the need that they have and we can anticipate a lot of times and we shouldn't because we don't know what God is doing in the heart of the people that he wants us to speak to. But we try to anticipate and second guess what their reaction is going to be. And whose problem is that? Is that my problem? How that man is going to react when I share the gospel with them? No. That's their problem. 
if you will, how they are going to react to that. But there are men and women around this world who are enduring much more than the threatenings that the apostles were going through early on. They were told they needed to not be preaching in, in uh, the name of Jesus any longer. You know, I was reading something about China today, and they have gone around and they're telling the Christians there that they can no longer worship Jesus, but they need to worship the president of China and the leaders of China. And if they don't do that, they lose their monthly stimulus. They lose their monthly benefit. They lose their monthly money that the government is giving to them. They lose what they need just to live a basic life. There was a woman that in the interview, uh, this woman is a diabetic, and she, they said that they came in and they destroyed some of her religious artifacts, if you will, the cross and I think some pictures of Jesus, and they destroyed them. And she lost what she needed in order to get her medicine. That's coming in China. And who knows what's going to happen in America. We need to be bold to proclaim God's word. We should pray for boldness. And later on, as Paul asked that God would give him boldness and a door of utterance, he says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, he says, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may boldly or open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds and therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now we're not in bonds. One day we might be in bonds. I don't know. Hopefully not. But if the Lord tarries, we may find ourselves to be in prison for preaching God's word. How will we speak boldly then if we don't do it now? We must remember that there are those that are sinking in sin just as Peter was sinking in the sea in Matthew chapter 14, if you want to take a look there. Matthew chapter 14, in verses uh, 29 through 31, Jesus is walking along the, uh, he's walking on the water. If I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, Matthew chapter uh, 14, verses 29 through 31. And uh, let me get there. Matthew chapter 14, verse 29, it says, uh, well, let me go back, and it says, uh, and Peter, in verse 28, it says, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Peter walked on water. We like to give Peter a lot of grief, but Peter walked on water. But when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink. Yesterday, Jenny and I, on the way up here, we were doing the second part of the trip. We did two-thirds on Monday, and we did a third of it yesterday, about. And we started listening to Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know if you've ever read or, or watched the movie. We watched the film years ago. I think I was like 10 years old, living in Dallas, and we watched the film. But in, in, a, in the beginning of this, Christian, the main actor, or the main character, was told to keep his eyes on the, on the light. And he said, if you keep your eyes, evangelist told him, he said, if you keep your eyes on the light, uh, you, will, you will make it to the gate and you'll be okay. You'll, you'll get to where you need to go. But you have to keep your eye on the light. Well, Christian didn't keep his eye on the light, and he and Pliable got stuck in the mire of despond. And Christian, having this burden on his back, began to sink in that mire. Just like Peter sank, just like if we do not follow what the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, if we do not, as the Bible says, lay aside the weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, we can find ourselves to be sunk in the mire of this world. Jeremiah, the prophet, was cast into a pit, and he was stuck in the mire at the bottom. Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, and he began to sink, and he cried out for Jesus to help him, and, of course, Jesus did. Didn't Jesus reach down and help each one of us when we cried out to him, when we got saved? And he reaches down that hand of mercy, and he pulls us out of that dirt and out of that mire to a life, and he sets us upon that rock that is himself. We must recognize there are people out there that are struggling against sinking deeper and deeper into sin. We can help them, but we need to share the gospel with them. The lifeboat that it's talking about in this passage could be considered to be uh, the lifeboat which we take to such people as the redemption that's available through the blood of Jesus Christ. Peter, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19 says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of men, 
or excuse me, from the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. God's word tells us that only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, can we, we be saved. If salvation were a lifeboat, it would be the vessel by which Christ brings us across sin's ocean kept afloat by his blood. Stanza number three focuses on the lost person's condition. It says, throw out the lifeline to danger fraught men, sinking in anguish where you've never been. Winds of temptation and billows of woe will soon hurl them out where the dark waters flow. How many of you have seen the dark waters of the ocean, maybe at night, and you look out and all it is just blackness? We've been on a couple of cruises, and we'd go up to the top of the, the ship there, where the, the topmost part where they allowed us to go, and we looked out, and while the, the moon is shining on the water, it's black. And it is terrifying to me to think of someone who has gone overboard in that kind of water, not being able to see where they're going, not being able to be found because it's too dark. And on a night where there's, no cloud, where there's no moon, there's no stars to shine any light on that water, it makes it even more difficult to find that person. Just as a ship's crew is in danger of being lost in a storm or in that story, men and women in sin are in danger of being lost eternally. 1 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and they that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That is a dangerous position for anyone to be in. There are those in this world who are dying and going to a place called hell where they will be forever. There is no reprieve. There is no getting out. But have you ever been lost on your way somewhere? Now, we have GPS now, but, but have you ever been driving somewhere and you've been lost? Or maybe you're walking somewhere and you've been lost? And the thought that comes through your head and hopefully the words that come to your mind and out your mouth are, Lord, help me get out of this. Will you please show me the way out? I've been there. I've been lost. And I have been lost in places that I wanted to get out of as quickly as I possibly could. I was with a friend in Chicago years ago. And, uh, and he didn't know where we were. I didn't know where we were. And there were things on the sides of the road that I didn't want to see. There were people that I didn't want to be around. And he stops at a red light. I told him, don't, what are you stopping for? <laughs> you don't stop. There's nobody around. You go, man. I, I don't care. Run the red light. I'll pay the ticket for you. Don't stop. I've been lost. And it was scary. But I knew who to cry out to. I knew who to go to for help. But there are those in this world who don't know who to turn to or who to cry out to, but we can show them. We know who to cry out to. Perhaps we've never been exactly where they are, but there's a part of this song that talks about restoring the erring, and we need to treat them with meekness and to consider ourselves, lest we also be tempted. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, go ahead and turn there. Paul talks about a brethren overtaken in a fault, and this, can be, this could be you and me. This could be some Christian that you know that's overtaken in something, and maybe you witness it. The Bible tells us if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think of himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. In this chapter of 6 of Galatians, Paul is applying uh, or applies freedom to our relationships. He's going to tell us that the Christian who walks in the Spirit is free from selfishness and so free to love others unselfishly. And you know what? We can love others unselfishly. My wife is one of the most unselfish people I know, and she loves me, uns and I'm not saying that because she's here. I'm saying that because it's the truth. My mom and dad, I watched that. we've watched them, and we talk about the way you all act with each other, and they're the most unselfish couple I've ever seen. And I'm not saying that because they're mom and dad, but they are an example of how a couple should act toward each other, unselfish in every way. And that's how we should be. The Bible tells us that uh, he wants spiritual people to show concern for one another and respond properly to a fellow Christian who's fallen into a sin. And that sin could be just about anything. It says, you which are spiritual, meaning uh, those who are manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. These believers with Christ-like character traits produced by the Holy Spirit encourages 
faltering Christians, and we should be encouraging to them. Now, the legalist is judgmental, harsh, and condemning to the word those that struggle with sin. But to, they know the law, and they know the consequences of falling short of obedience, but they don't know how to show mercy. And to illustrate grace, Paul represents uh, this hypocritical, I'm sorry, hypothetical case of somebody who has fallen into a sin, or a believer that's caught, meaning that the sin was not premeditated, but it was actually used once to describe a Roman legion that had been overrun by a Jewish military force. And the way that the spiritual one, the way that you and I should deal with someone who is uh, dealing with a sinning brother is to restore them gently, like to mend or uh, like a net or to restore as a broken bone. And the sinning Christian is like a broken bone that needs to be mended, a part of the body of Christ that must reset. And it must be done. If any of you have ever broken a bone, it doesn't heal immediately. It takes time for that bone to heal. I've broken my arm. I've broken my collarbone. It didn't heal immediately. And it was painful when it happened. But we can be gentle with bringing that person. A gentle and a graceful response can help. We can only ask ourselves how we would want to be treated if that was us. Ahead of this verse, God tells us we cannot be, or that he cannot be tempted. In James 1, 14 through 15, unless we share the gospel message, the winds of temptation will lead that person to death. It says, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. And enticed. And then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth death of sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. God can't be tempted. It's man that is tempted of his own lust. And my former pastor used to say to us men, he said, You may not be able to control the first look, but you can control the second. If we don't share the gospel with poor, struggling souls, the weight of sin is going to drag them deeper and deeper and eventually into the pits of hell will they be separated from God forever. Stanza number four focuses on the lost person's rescuers. That's us. It says, soon the season of rescue be over. Soon they will drift to eternity shore. Haste then, my brother, no time for delay, but throw out the lifeline and save them today. For each person, the season of rescue is over when we die. Hebrews 9.27 says, and it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. We're all going to die. And one day we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, whether the beam seat or the great white throne. Those of us who are saved don't have to stand before the great white throne, which I'm glad for. But the Bible tells us that we will be judged. Some will be judged because of their rejection of Christ. And that great white throne is a judgment seat that no man, woman, or child should ever want to be judged in front of. And at that time, he says, he will drift to eternity shore to stand unprepared before God in judgment. 2 Corinthians Chapter 5 and verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, that today is the day of salvation. Therefore, the time for us to seek and save the lost is now, just as the time for salvation for the lost is today. And many times in Scripture we find that God demands obedience he demands obedience to commands, and there's always consequences for disobedience. And he expects us to obey immediately. If you think of the men that obeyed immediately and what the reward was, we think of Abram. God told him what to do, and the Bible says in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 4 that he did as the Lord commanded. It says he did as the Lord commanded him. God told him to go, and he got up, and he did what he was told to do. He didn't delay. The Bible tells us that uh, God blessed him to be a great nation, and by him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And we have the Savior who came out of that line. If we think of someone who disobeyed, we think of Jonah. The Bible tells us he didn't obey. He got swallowed by a whale, spit out, sunburned, and he remained angry. He, I don't know if he ever changed. I have no idea. But the Bible tell, or this song finishes with, throw out the lifeline, Throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline. Throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. If we were to see a person drowning in the sea, we would try to do everything we could to help them. If we were to see a person trapped in a burning building, would we not run in and try to save them there as well? Compassion for our fellow human beings should motivate us to help them. It's very important is a person's spiritual condition than his physical life. Therefore, when we see a person lost in sin, our compassion 
should lead us to throw out the lifeline. Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. From going out and doing the things which you've said, um, one of the things I know in my, my own life is what we look at is basically we know people are dying and going to hell around us, right? That's, that's, not even a, that's not even a question. When's the last time you actively went out and told somebody? You see, what you truly believe is how you act out, right? So if you don't really believe there's a hell that's going to destroy and, I mean, kill that people are going to be sent to, that's going to not really motivate you too much to go tell them about it. If you think that, if you don't believe that you are the one that you've been placed in that situation because God has placed you there because you are the Christian that's supposed to be that light to give the gospel, you're not going to do it, right? Do you really believe all sinners are going to go to hell? I mean, what, what you do with your life really dictates what you believe internally. You, can't, you can say it all you want, but if your life doesn't back it up, you really don't believe it sometimes. You've got to really check that out. So thank you for that challenge, even affecting other Christians and things like that. We've got to get out there and throw out those lifelines, right? There's someone out there, someone that needs to be saved. And one of the other scary passages brother, brought to my attention, <clears throat> one of the scariest passages I've read in the Bible was uh, where it goes, uh, the summer is ended, yes. the harvest is past." And we are not saved. Look at this world. I'm not sure we're going to be around for too much longer. we got to get out there and give that gospel. There's a lot of people that need to be saved. Don't let it be said on your watch when we stand before the Lord to have the Lord say, I had you over there. Why didn't you speak to that person? Now the summer's ended. The harvest has passed. And that person's not saved. His blood or her blood will I require at your hands. There's some good stuff going on. I mean, it's good. It's good. And we shouldn't be afraid of anything. We, we got the Holy Spirit of God. We got the Word of God. We got a good, solid church. We got fellow Christians. Whenever a missionary preaches, it always, it always burns my heart because they always have a heart. That's why they're missionaries. They want to see people saved. That's why they're giving up where they're going to go see people saved, right? And that, that's always a big challenge to me. So thank you, brother. I really appreciate that. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we'll take some prayer requests, and we'll move on. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given to us to be challenged by the Word of God tonight. Father, even I'll, Father, I don't even know if the hymns would be written today if they'd be that rich in doctrine or thought to motivate people to get out there and serve. Father, when I hear some of the music that's put out today, it's all about ourselves, and it's not about serving. It's not about you and what you've done. And, and, and Lord, I just pray that we would invest ourselves in some of those old-fashioned hymns and, and, and understand that those people had a real burden for people, had, had good, solid theological background. And, and Father, that could be such a challenge and encouragement to us. Now, Lord, I just pray that you burden our hearts tonight. Give us that boldness. You've, you've given us the Holy Spirit of God. You've given us a place where we should be able to witness and to be effective at. Help us, Lord, to get out there and do it. Help us to submit to the Holy Spirit of God, look for those opportunities, and then preach the gospel faithfully and accurately and that you determine the results. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Please bless your people here tonight. Thank you that they're here tonight. I pray now as we bring our request before the Lord, before you, Father, that uh, we would not do it in an arrogant way, but we'd come boldly through the blood of Christ and let our, our requests be made known to you with thanksgiving. Please bless your people here tonight, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.